Hello, thanks for coming. Nice to, to see everyone. Um, I'm uh, associated loosely with the Broad. I guess I'm a, an affiliate. Um, I've done some work with uh, primarily people in Pardisa's group and um, uh, in particular with, with Hayden. And I'm really looking forward to his talk. I think he has a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. Um, and I was pleased just to get a chance to introduce myself to those of you who haven't had the chance to meet before um, by doing this sort of primer about uh, an area that I've been involved in, um, locality sensitive hashing, which yeah, plays a part in, in some of Hayden's uh, work. Um, and so this talk is sort of set up as, as like a, a, a mini lecture, like, um, but but I've tried to throw in some history about, you know, sort of where these ideas came from and, and what they're used for. So I will move on with that and please just ask questions as we go um, and go from there. All right, so, you know, like I said, this is a, a bit of history, you know, like after graduate school, I worked at Digital Systems Research Center. That was part of Digital Equipment Corporation. Um, I'd ask for a show of hands to see how many people actually had heard of or remember Digital Equipment Corporation. There's probably like an age threshold where, you know, yeah, you, you know what Digital Equipment Corporation was beyond a, a certain point. It was certainly a big player in, in Massachusetts area um, that has, has since disappeared. Um, and my mentor there um, was Andre Broder, um, who to the extent that there are like people who you can say, you know, founded or, or, or started what we would call today web science, um, Andre would be one of those key people, you know, the study of study of the World Wide Web and the Internet. He was one of the, the first uh, people to look at it through, through the lens of theoretical foundations and, and treating it as a science. Um, and so, you know, while I, I was at Digital Systems Research Center, um, Andre had me read this paper that he read that he, he was kind of excited about. Um, and you know, if you look at the abstract, you're going to see pretty much what, what I'm gonna talk about and really what the, the key ideas are of a certain type of locality sensitive hashing that some of you may have seen or, or have been aware of, um, but might not know its, its background called, called min hashing. And you know, he was interested, and in I'll talk a bit about the motivation you know, in a second, but this is the, the early days of the web and so we were, he was interested in things related to search engines. And I guess the, the search engine people sort of came in to him and said, like, we've got this problem, right? Um, we want to know when two documents are almost exactly the same, right? Now, determining if two documents are exactly the same, um, you know, that, that turns out to be a, a pretty easy problem, right? And maybe I'll just wander over to my notebook over here, right? If, I, if all I care about are two documents, X and Y, if they're exactly the same, right? And what people do today is instead of actually comparing byte by byte, if there are whole collections of documents that they're worried about that they might be the same, they apply um, uh, some sort of hash function, okay? So, for those who don't know, and, and sometimes I've given talks and, and I forget to realize people might not know what a, a hash function actually is, right? A hash function is, is just that, it's a function. It's supposed to map, you know, long things into short things to short strings. And in particular, it's supposed to, you know, one use for a hash function or a hash function in the context we're looking at here is to provide a sort of fingerprint, right? A, an identifier for a document, okay? And so you're taking some big document, one of your Word documents, and you're turning it into say like 64 bits, or it could be more than 64 bits depending uh, on the situation. Um, and often these hash functions, they're designed to look random, Right, but they're an actual function, so they're not actually random. You get back the same answer every time. All right, and, and the point is that you use this as sort of a fingerprint to test for exact, um, exact equality of a document, right? So if you have two documents, um, if they're the same, they're certainly gonna give the same hash value. And the idea is that if they're different, you can make it you know, as 
unlikely as you want for your application that they would actually come up as being the same. All right, so uh, finding exact duplicates is, is a pretty easy or straightforward problem. Um, but he was asked for a, a, a sort of different problem, right? Where it's just that given two documents, you know, do they, are they similar? Do they resemble each other? He also looked at a, a similar problem I won't talk about as much, which is, you know, containment. Does one document appear inside another? Okay. And as you note in the abstract, and I'll be talking about this, he says the idea is to reduce these issues to a set intersection problem that can be done with random sampling and done independently for each document. Um, so don't worry if you don't understand all, all that terms or terminology, like we'll be going over this in a few slides after I get through a bit more of the history. All right, so again, like we weren't, you know, or, uh, Andre wasn't motivated particularly by biology, right? What, what he was motivi motivated by was search engines. This was the early days of search engines. And in particular, the Digital Systems Research Center was the home of Alta Vista. And so another question I sometimes ask to see how old the audience is, is, is how many people have heard of Alta Vista or, or know what Alta Vista is? So again, there's sort of an age threshold, what falls off a cliff. Um, but, you know, before there was Google, right? Good, I see at least one hand up, you know, one thumbs up that people are remembering Alta Vista. Um, if, before there was Google, there, there was Alta Vista, which was sort of like, uh, not necessarily like the first search engine, but maybe the first uh, big search engine, right? And Alta Vista had this pro exactly this problem, right? Which is that it was trying to collect and, and categorize and, and deal with all the documents that it was finding then in the World Wide Web. Um, you know, it's it's kind of fun to look back over the this historical data, right? So, you know, they were looking at a collection of 30 million documents, um, which was, you know, big, I guess, uh, 20 to 25 years ago. Um, you know, the, and the total input data is like 150 gigabytes, and that was considered big, you know. Uh, and I, I imagine for many of you, these data set sizes sound ridiculously small currently, um, but, you know, that's what was big back in those days. Um, Right, and, and the high level idea here again was to, to determine if two sequences web documents were, were similar. Um, all right, so, you know, personally where, where I came involved um, was, uh, again, I, I was working there with Andre uh, at the time. Uh, I had actually been Andre's summer intern before and then managed to get a, a job at the company. Um, and we actually had a, a, another summer intern there, Moses Charikar, um, professor at Stanford, um, has done a lot of work also on locality sensitive hashing. Um, and Alan Fries was a visitor from the summer um, from Carnegie Mellon. He was hanging out for, for a few weeks at the research lab, as, as people do. Um, and so the theory stuff, which again will, will be stuff I'll sort of talk about, but sort of giving the abstract here, is looking at some feature called minwise independence, right? So we're trying to figure out, um, you know, the, this funny notion of, you know, you have some set of objects, we don't know what the set of objects actually is, um, but the idea is that we have some set of permutations that when we apply it to our collection of objects, each one is likely to be the smallest one with equal probability, re regardless of what that set is. Okay, and we'll, we'll again see in a minute um, where this comes in uh, and why it's actually useful for this problem as we sort of state in the bottom of the abstract, uh, you know, why this theory is useful for this near duplicate document detection problem. Um, we weren't the only ones thinking along these lines. Um, Edith Cohen, who is a, a senior researcher, or I forget her, her exact title, um, but she's a, a, a big person in, in Google uh, currently, was, was also working on some similar things at the time. She was looking at a sort of different application or a different problem um, related uh, to size estimation. Um, so 
you know, similar in spirit, just as we were looking at estimating document similarity, and, and we're going to turn that into a size estimation problem. She was looking at, at other size estimation problems. Okay. And the stuff that I'm talking about, this, this minwise independent stuff, um, if you've probably heard of it or the context you would have heard of it in, in biology, uh, would have been under the notion or, or naming of, of minhash. And you know, I'm going to talk a bit more generally about locality sensitive hashing, um, but minhash is, is sort of a foundational or, or fundamental way to do locality sensitive hashing. It's one of the ways to do locality sensitive hashing. And in particular, it's one that has been used um, in, in various biological applications. Uh, and you know, just uh, again, I, I'm not an expert in the biology, and, and I think Hayden may refer to some of this in his talk, although he has like, you know, plenty to talk about, so he may just, but just touch on this. Um, I'll bring a bit more about this paper um, back in a bit, but the, the paper I found that seemed to have these techniques that was cited most when I, when I went to Google was this paper called MASH from, you know, about five years back um, that talks about Again, the, this minhash dimensionality, dimensionality reduction technique, locality sensitive hashing, um, and we'll we'll look at some of the applications that it discusses for this a bit later. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, I guess, is that uh, you know again the, the sort of connections here. Um, Paul Melstead um, was a student, a graduate student um, of Alan Fries. Um, you know, who again was part of this original paper. Um, I actually worked with um while Paul was a Paul was a graduate student, I worked with him and Alan on some papers related to uh, another sort of area of interest in randomized algorithms on cuckoo hashing. Um I understand uh Paul, I think, is in Iceland and and is uh as a professor and works on um you know, algorithmic biology um, and, and has done other work on sort of applications of algorithmic ideas to, to biological problems. Okay, so again, uh, the background or, or, you know, where I thought or, or came into this picture had to do with Alta Vista. And so to try and set your mind back to this, this setting, we're talking here about the really early days of the web and web search. Um, and so there were lots of duplicate documents and, and near duplicate documents. So part of it was just, you know, it was the early days of the web, people were copying pages. Um, the typical example I give for where you'd get like near duplicate documents is for standard documents like man pages. So, you know, Back in the old days, I don't know if anyone still used them now, but if you're in a Unix system, you can like, you know, type man, whatever your command is, and you get a little help page for it. It's the, the manual page, I guess. Um, and people were putting these up on the web. And like, they're such a good example because what you would find on the web is that literally everyone was putting up the same man pages. They were like standard, except that maybe the header and footer, right, would be different. You know, you'd see the same man pages, but it would be copyright IBM or it'd be copyright HP or it would be copyright, like, even though it was the same context, somehow they were all copywriting it and putting their own copyright things on the bottom or they might have something on top, right? But the documents were pretty much exactly the same, except for these, you know, header or footers, um, or maybe once in a while there'd be a, a stray word that would change or, or something like that. So man pages are a prototypical example, but there, there were plenty of other examples of people just, you know, copying pages and, and making small changes and so on. Um, as you can imagine, you know, I'm going to be talking about this from the setting of Alta Vista. A lot of these techniques are actually used these days, or, or these types of techniques are, are also used these days for cheat detection. So, you know, the plagiarizing essays and so on. Um, some of the tools that are out there for that use uh, these, these techniques as well. So why is this a problem for Alta Vista that there's lots of 
duplicate documents or, or near duplicate documents, right? So it's it's really bad for for search, right? Um, it's it's bad for two main reasons. One is the reason of just the user interface, the user interaction, right? So you're doing a search and you ask for something, and you know you're getting presented the search results. And if the search results are like fifty near duplicate copies of the same man page, you know that's not really the interaction you want. You don't want your you know, you don't want to get these 50 links that you're getting in your search and have them all really be the same thing, except they're different, you know, companies, company right, or, so, or some other small deviation. Um, so I think, you know, certainly the, probably the biggest motivation was just from the user interaction point of view. This is not what you want to give back to users. You want to know if, if two do documents are the same or very nearly the same. Um, the other thing is that at the time, and this may be hard to believe, like, uh, but but at the time, one of the bottlenecks for for Alta Vista was memory, or I'm not sure it was really a bottleneck, but it was certainly like a, a significant cost, right? So storing all this data, storing all the web pages they were crawling, right? They needed these really really large machines to, you know, really large storage machines to store them, and. Um, you know, it, 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 these machines were expensive, right? Like each machine was like a million dollars or some significant amount. And, you know, so they were at least thinking, do we really have to store all these duplicates of, of the same page? Maybe there's a better way to store them. Maybe we don't really want to store duplicates at all. We can just mark that it's a near, near duplicate and keep it. All right, so there is needed or, or the, you know, they were looking for some method to detect these near duplicate documents. And as I sort of said before, like exact duplicates, you know, that was sort of known. That, that wasn't really a problem, right? That you could solve by straightforward hashing um, using, you know, at the time it would have been like MD5 or, or some, you know, standard hash function, right? But the, the near duplicates people did not know really how to deal with. Um, so before now I, I start to actually get on to, you know, go from motivation to maybe a, a little bit of math, just any questions or, or thoughts or concerns from the, the background? Okay. All right, so how how is it, or you know, what what were Andre's ideas for for solving this problem? Okay, so the first idea is that even though these were documents, right, um, you know, being that we were you know, theoretical computer science type people, words are hard to figure out or understand, whereas numbers are easy, right? So so the first step was to say, let's not work with these you know English texts let's turn them into numbers, okay? So we, we aren't going to think of words, we're going to, to think a, of numbers. And I'll, I'll sort of show in a bit how we move from, from words to numbers, but for right now, let's just worry about the problem in terms of, of numbers and, and do sort of what's going to be the, the problem that we, we use or we, we re reduce the, the document similarity problem to. So the idea here is that we have two sets A and B of numbers. We can think of them as 64-bit numbers for convenience, right? And what we're going to call the resemblance is, you know, the size of the intersection over the size of the union. Okay. And it turned out like we we didn't actually know this at the time, you know, but we weren't the first person to look at this this measure. Um, and it's actually called, you know, in the in the literature called the Jacquard similarity. Okay. And so like, what are some of the key properties of the resemblance, right? So, um, so first of all, like I, I always like to throw this out when I, I'm teaching this or, or so on, just to, to make sure people awake, like when is the resemblance equal to one? Someone can throw up an answer in the chat or something. Say. Like what, what makes the resemblance score equal to one? The sets must be exactly equal. Right, so when 
resemblance equals one, that means the sets are equal, right? That A union B and A intersect B are the same thing. So they're the same thing when the sets are equal, right? So the resemblance is one when the sets are equal. Um, and what does it mean when the resemblance is zero? The no overlaps. Joint. Yeah, sets are disjoint, right? All right. So, right. So what we've got is that the resemblance is you know, we can think of as a score that takes on a value between zero and one. You know, close to one means that we think the sets are, are similar and that, and what we mean by similar is something very natural, right? That the, the, their intersection is most of the two sets combined, right? And if it's close to zero, right? That means they're, they're close to disjoint sets, right? All right, so this is a pretty, you know, there, there are certainly other properties you can look at for resemblance, but I think this is, the, or for Jacquard similarity, but this I think is one of the, the key ones, right? Which is just that it's a score between zero and one, and it has some clear, you know, intuition that, you know, one means the sets are the same, zero means they're disjoint, and a score in between is, well, somewhere in between for that, all right? All right, so, since I, I, I skipped this over, uh, maybe this is step two. Uh, I don't know if this is a typo, I forgot the slides, but uh, you know, part of, part of the, this other step is, okay, how do we actually go from documents to sets of numbers, right? Okay, and so um, this is a method that Andre liked to refer to as shingling. And that's, you know, you'll see that term actually still in, in the art or in the literature. Um, all right, so you start with your document and the idea is first you canonicalize the document and that typically means things like you'll remove punctuation, not worry about capitalization and so on. So it really is just like a, a stream of words, okay? Um, and then what you do is you take every set of K consecutive words to form a shingle, right? And so we called this shingling because you know the, the sets of four words overlap each other like the, the shingles on a roof. And so here, right, every set of K consecutive words form a shingle. Here in this example I have below, you know, K equals four, every four words forms a shingle. And we take those four words and then we apply some hash function. We turn it from a string into a number, okay? Um, and typically, you know, again, you might hash it each little substring of four words into 64 bits. All right, so now I can think of my document as a set of numbers, right? I'm now in this situation, right, where, where I started with, with resemblance, that I have two documents and I say, well, I, I've turned my two documents actually into sets of numbers. And so I, when I talk about the resemblance, I can look at the resemblance as sets of numbers. And, right, again, just a reminder of what I was saying before, when I, when I use this term hash to a number, I'm a, just sort of assuming that we have some good function around that you know, takes objects, in this case, strings, turns them into numbers, word strings to 64-bit numbers. And again, the idea is that these things should, in some sense, look random, right? So we can think of each um, value as being a random 64-bit string. And that doesn't mean that, like, if you hash the same string over and over, you get different values. It's not actually random. It's just that we think of hash functions as, as looking random. Um, even though they'll give you back the same answer when you give them the same input. Okay, um, before we go on, just some intuition of like, why does hashing a document this way preserve sort of the notion of, of similarity, right? Why is this like a, a good idea or what's the connection, I guess, between you know, the similarity of the sets of numbers and the, and the similarity of the document? So, you know, let's start with one question. Suppose I have the same document, 
but I change a word. Okay. So what would that actually like do to the similarity? Like what changes in these sets of numbers if I change one word? Four of the, well, depending on the size, four of yeah. the values change. Yeah. Right. But so, the rest so, of them, so the similarity goes down by a little four, bit. a little bit. Right. So right. again, the, the documents are reasonably large. These are these are big sets. If you if you change one word, sure you're you're changing some of the shingles, but it's just a constant number, right? So sure that you'll reduce the, the similarity a little bit, but but not a whole lot. Okay. So let's maybe look at uh, a different example. Suppose, and again, think now maybe in the setting of plagiarism detection. Um, suppose I have the same document, but I switch the order of two paragraphs. Right, again, so what, what happens to the similarity in that case? So here it's just the shingles that overlapped the um, the overlap both paragraphs, which is a small number. Yeah. yeah. So it's, right. So if I switch the order of two paragraphs, like the the there'll be some boundary effects, right? So okay. like at the interface of those two paragraphs, there'll be changes. You know, I guess maybe at the paragraph before to that paragraph or the paragraph after that paragraph, there'll be changes. So there'll be some boundary changes, but again, there, there aren't going to be a lot of changes, right? So even if I had a document with just two paragraphs, right? If I switch the order of those paragraphs, and again, the paragraphs are any reasonable size, the, the shingling should still give me a very high score, right? It will, it will still remain close to one. Um, now, on the other hand, let's suppose that I, you know, had my handy thesaurus, right? And I just went around changing, you know, as many words as I could in the thesaurus. Um, always a fun exercise to do. It's wacky what you get when you, you start to do that, you know, but ostensibly I'd be, you know, keeping the same meaning, but I might be changing words more frequently, right? So, you know, what might happen there is that, yeah, actually the similarity would get small, right? Right, and so one of the things to keep in mind of this approach or the, the way that it's referred to, um, um, I see, so Seth is asking a question, the shingling themselves overlap, right? So, um, I'm not sure what you mean by one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, but uh, if those are, if that's just the words, yeah, like the shingles overlap, we take words one through four, we take through words two through five and so on, right? And actually, maybe before I get back to the last point, that's a good point. Why do we have overlapping shingles, right? Why didn't I just say, well, take the first four words and make them a shingle and take the next four words and make them a shingle? Like, why do I have them overlap like that? Why didn't I just say, you know, well, let's divide the documents into blocks of four words. What's the problem if I do that? So people are saying context. There's actually a, a very particular reason, right? That, that I don't break things into four words. Right, so Luca here's got it, right? Adding a single word would make the similarity zero, right? So if, I, if I'm doing every block of four words, right? And then, you know, I take your document, um, you know, and, and up at the top, I write by Michael Nitzenmacher, right? Now everything's shifted, right? So none of the collections of four words are going to be the same, Right, but the documents are entirely the same except for the, you know, by Michael Mitzenmacher part. So, so there's a reason we keep the overlap, right? Because otherwise adding a single word would, would mess up the offsets. So great, thanks. Um, all right, um, so if we use a thesaurus, the similarity would get small. And the way we say this is, you know, what we're keeping track of is a syntactic similarity, not a semantic similarity. 
right? We, we aren't actually caring about the meanings of the words. We're really just caring about, you know, the actual words themselves. Okay. All right, so now given this, you could compute the similarity or you could compute the resemblance of two sets by comparing all the numbers in both sets, right? Um, so if we think of the sets as being roughly of size n, say, then computing the resemblance here would take, you know, order n squared steps, doing n comparisons versus n comparisons. And if you think about it for a second, you'd say, oh, well, like, clearly I can do better than n squared. I could sort the sets and, and then get n log n, right? You know, sort the sets, each of the sets in n log n time, and then just do a, a linear walkthrough to, to figure out how many things were equal. Um, um, but both of these ideas are, are like still bad because again, we're, we're working in the context of Alta Vista or, or in biological settings, biology, we have lots and lots of sets and the sets themselves are, are large. There are ways of making the sets smaller, you know, by only keeping some of the hashes by saying like, I'll only keep the hashes where the last six bits are zero or something. And that, that reduces the number of hashes I'll keep by 64. Um, so there are easy ways to reduce the size of the set, but, but there are going to be lots of sets in the situations we care about. And so the idea is to say, let's not use a whole set, let's use a sketch of a set. Okay, so what do I mean by a sketch? So generally a sketch is just supposed to be a short representation of an object like a set. Um, so here's now where we get into this notion of permutations that I was talking about before. Let me give you a, a size one sketch, okay? So we permute the universe of numbers, right? So I'm not just talking about numbers in any particular set. If we're using like 64 bit, uh, hashes, what I mean by permute the universe of, of numbers, uh-oh, um, is I go, uh, I have a permutation going from all 64-bit numbers to all 64-bit numbers, okay? So I suppose that I have some easy way to deal with or compute these permutations. I don't worry about that. But then I say what my sketch is, is I, is I pick some random permutation from 64-bit numbers to 64-bit numbers. I, when I have a set A and I talk about the sketch being the minimum of pi A, right? what I mean by pi A is that if my set is like 2, 16, 64, 128, right? my new set pi of A is pi of two, pi of four, pi of 60, or sorry, pi of 16, pi of 64, pi of 128. That is, I apply the permutation to each item individually, right? And then I find which is the smallest element. And now sort of the magic question is like, okay, why do I do that? Well, Let's suppose that I have two sets A and B, and I ask now, what's the probability that the, the minimum of these two sets after I apply some one of these permutations, what's the probability that these two are the same? Just notation. Um, I, I, yeah. I think we know what you mean, but the two to the 64 up top, um, those, are, those are all the numbers from zero up to... Yep. That's Right. Yeah. Yes, that's meant to be like the, the set of all 64 bit numbers. So 0 to 2 to 63, or yeah. Two to six, four minus. Is, yeah. is it just the resemblance? Is it just the resemblance? Very good. So this probability is the resemblance of A and B. Um, I do actually teach, teach this in my undergrad class, and I like to pause with this question. And I always like when students are like refusing to answer the question, I say, there, you know, you know you should know there's only one answer to this question that it could possibly be because I spent the last 20 minutes talking about resemblance. So even if you do not know why, you do know that the answer is the resemblance. So even if you have no idea why the answer is resemblance, you know that the answer is the resemblance because I, I've been talking about it, okay? Um, so 
and the the way to see that right is to think okay well yeah it is really just to look at a venn diagram okay so i have my set a of numbers i have my set b of numbers right and you know i'm applying this permutation to them so that the orders of these numbers all get jumbled right so when I ask, what's the probability that the minimum of one set is equal to the minimum of the other set, right? What I'm really saying is that if I look at the two sets together, is the minimum element in both? Is it something in the intersection, right? The only way the minimum after applying the permutations, right? If I think of permuting all the elements in A union B randomly, and then I ask, well, what's the probability that that the smallest one was in both of them? Well, that that's really just saying, or the probability that the minimum is equal, that's really just saying that the minimum was in both sets. That is, it's in the intersection. So the probability is just the size of the intersection over the size of the union. It's the resemblance. Does it have to be a permutation? Could you just apply a... I mean, I don't think most hash functions are actually permutations, right? Yeah, so so it should be, well, so, so uh, you, you are, if you don't have it be a permutation, there's the possibility of other collisions, right? Of two things that aren't equal mapping into. You can turn hash functions for per, for that are not permutation hash functions. There are ways of turning them into permutation hash functions. Okay. That's not really that that big a big a loss and again sort of the work we were doing the theoretical work i was pointing to from the beginning was was like oh how do we construct you know families of of permutations <laughs> and in fact sort of what the theory we were looking at was saying is like these don't actually have to be completely random permutations um but they just need to have this property Right, we're looking at what you want is families of permutations with the property that when I pick a permutation randomly, it, it has this property. Okay. okay. All right, so of course we don't want to sketch with just one value or, or one, you know, that that's not necessarily particularly helpful, um, but we can do like a hundred permutations, right? So the idea is now each document gets a calling card and the calling card consists of a hundred numbers, right? And that calling card or sketch is just the minimum of its set values, you know, for each permutation for a hundred permutations. Right, so essentially it's just saying, repeat the last thing we did, but do it for a hundred different permutations. So I have just not one value, but a hundred values. And so now to compare the sketches, all I have to do is say, let's look at the number of matches and divide it by a hundred, right? And that's an estimate of the resemblance because the probability that you get a match is the resemblance. So if I do it a hundred times and say, well, how many matches did I get over a hundred? that's going to estimate the resemblance. All right, so in particular in the web setting, the goal is to separate out high and low resemblances. Okay. So what we might care about is this sort of idea of like, well, is the resemblance big or is it small, right? So I might choose a threshold and say, if you know, it's bigger than 90, I'll call it a, a near duplicate. If like it matches on over 90 of 100, then I think, yeah, those are probably duplicates or near duplicate documents. And if it's less than that, I'll be safe and keep it. And so if the actual resemblance between two documents is R, right, then the probability that we exceed this 90 threshold is just the tail of the binomial distribution, which is easy enough to, to calculate. Right, and you can get these, this chart sort of saying if 90% is your threshold, right? Like ideally what you'd want is some sort of filter, right? Ideally what this curve would look like would be in a, an exact sort of cliff here where you'd say, aha, if it's the resemblance is over 90%, 
then I say it's a, you know, I catch that with probability one. And if it's less than 90%, I catch that with probability, you know, I, I, I say it's a match with probability zero. And what we see here is you get something pretty close to that. I hear engineering engineers call this something like a low pass filter, right? If the resemblance is like above 95, then you're like 99.99 plus percent to catch it. And if the resemblance is like, you know, below 50, you know, the probability that you, you think it's above 90% is, you know, two to the minus whatever, but two to the minus some big number, right? So things that are matches, you're very likely to catch. Things that aren't matches, you're very unlikely to say are, are near duplicate documents, right? Um, and the key is, is that in the setting we're looking at, right, in the, or that we were looking at for Alta Vista, you don't need to be 100% correct, right? You don't need to get all the matches, whatever that means. Um, you know, and, and if you once in a while say two things are a match when they aren't, right, that's not great. Then you're not keeping a documenter or presenting a document, then maybe that would upset the particular individual, right? But we're in the setting of web crawls, right? So you were crawling the web, there were things you were gonna miss all the time anyway. So the point is, is that it didn't have to be perfect. Um, and you know, in practice, there's all sorts of efficiency improvements and so on. Um, you can like, you know, use groups of hashes and rehash them together and, and do some, some other sorts of stuff um, that made it more practical. But the key idea is this, just this notion of a sketch. So each document is now actually represented by a fixed sized amount, right? Just a, like a hundred samples as it were. And you can compare two documents just by comparing these hundred samples. All right, so this is an example of a locality sensitive hashing, right? So in standard hashing, like I, I tried to describe before, you really want each hash value to look random and, and independent, right? Like hashing an object should look like rolling a die. You have no idea what it's gonna come out, right? In locality sensitive hashing, you want something a bit different, right? You're sort of, again, assigning something a short identifier, right? But you want similar items to get the same hash value to be, you know, more likely, if things are similar, they, they should get, or nearby, if we're talking about in, in a metric space, say, you want them to get the same hash value more often, right? So this is an example of that. If, if two sets are close, that is, they resemble each other, they're going to be more likely to get the same hash value, say, on a single permutation. Um, so this, this idea of locality sensitive hashing came out of work um, at Stanford um, by Pyotr Indik and Rajiv Matwani. And there it was for issues related to the, the nearest neighbor problem, right? Trying to find nearest neighbors in, in a metric space. And the idea was that like, if two points are near each other in the same metric space, you're likely to hash them into the same bucket. And in fact, there, there are sort of two definitions of what it means to be a locality sensitive hashing. One is sort of the way I've been describing it, which is that you know, there's some similarity function and two items get the same hash value um, with a probability that's equal to the similarity, hash, similarity function. Um, a sort of more general definition is that you can say, well, you know, if I have some sort of distance on objects, um, uh, oops, there's a, doo -doo. sorry. Um, if the distances are close, then the probability that I get the same hash value is high, right? Is at least some value P. And if the distance is far, I sort of forgot, left out the C value here, some constant times this value, then the probability that the hash values are the same is small. Right. This is sort of a more general way of looking at it. If things are close, then they're likely to get the same hash value. If they're far, they shouldn't be. Right. This is 
It's a way of setting up the definitions. Um, so this is used in all sorts of problems um, for finding similar genes, audio, video images. Um, it's even becoming a tool for security systems, right? You use this sort of technology to figure out if you're seeing um, suspicious computer behaviors that are similar to other suspicious behaviors you've seen before. And that might flag that you have a program that's doing evil things. Um, nearest neighbor search, clustering. Okay, so here are some other simple LHS schemes. Um, if you're doing the Hamming distance over just binary strings, right? So the Hamming distance is the number of places where the strings are different. Um, uh, a locality sense of hash function is just like return of one of the bits, right? And so then the probability that two things are the same is, you know, just one minus the the distance, the Hamming distance divided by the number of dimensions. And the idea is that if you want to improve this, right? If you want to say, well, I want to separate out further the gap between saying things are the same and saying things are the different, you could repeat this multiple times. You pick multiple bits, right? So you'd say, well, if it matches on three bits, or maybe you know, pick some threshold, if it matches on two of the three bits or something, I, I say it's good. And otherwise I say it's bad or it's not a match. Um, another is called SimHash. Um, so this is for points in space. It's maybe easiest to think about two dimensions, right? So in, in two dimensions, the idea is you pick a random hyperplane and you just look at the sign and say, you know, what's the probability I get the same sign? And that gives a bit, right? So like in two dimensions, you know, if I have these two points, Right, the idea is I pick a, a random hyperplane, uh, you know, I can think of it as a random vector through the origin. And the question is, does it split these points or not split these points, right? And the probability that happens depends on the angle between those points. And so that works even in, in higher dimensions, right? So again, you get the probability, you get the same bit out depends on the angle or, or the distance in the angular sense between those points. And again, you can repeat this multiple times if you want to increase the accuracy. Um, this is another one. It's a bit more complicated. You can do things based on stable distributions. This is just a, a, a bucketing type thing, um, where if you have a vector, you, you know dot product it with entries from you know, another vector, and then you sort of round it into a bucket. Um, this one's a bit more complicated, so I don't have as much to say about this other than that, you know, it's another locality sensitive hash function here uh, for real valued vectors. Um, and it's based on, on a bucketing based on dot producting with a, a random vector. Um, and there's more, like this is still an active area of research. Some new stuff is like there's something called asymmetric locality sensitive hashing. So the idea here is that like in all these things that we've talked about, you sort of treat the two things that you're comparing the same way. In asymmetric locality sensitive hashing, there's like pre-processed data in a database. You're trying to match like some query to something in your database. And the idea is that you may actually use different hash functions on the queries and on the database. And somehow that actually makes things, can make things better, which to me is a bit surprising. I wouldn't have thought that, you know, oh, using different hash functions on the query data and then you do on the database data can somehow improve things, but amazingly like it can and it does. Um, you know, just returning briefly, and, and then I'll finish up to, to the Minhash paper, right? Again, it, you know, uh, Minhash is used in, in various biological applications, you know, from the MASH paper um, that, that we looked at earlier, you know, if, if you read this, this abstract, again, you know, it, it's pretty clear. It's just saying, well, we're, we're using the Minhash technique, right? We use, again, you see the keywords I've been talking about, sketches. 
um, you know, the similarity can be rapidly estimated with bounded error, right? That's just what we were showing. I was talking about Word documents, but, and they're looking at biological sequences, um, you know, and like I said, the error depends only on the size of the sketch and not the genome size. That was the like, yep, we, we just take a hundred permutations. Doesn't matter how long the documents are, we can estimate the resemblance. Okay. Um, and so they talk about applications to you know cluster sequence data, species label, guide trees, genomic database search. Um, right. At, and again, just somewhere in the paper, you know, right. Uh, again, we can see they're talking about estimating of the Jacquard index. That's just we were talking about. Um, Right, I was talking about shingles. I guess biology people talk about shared k-mers, right? Same, same idea. You know, it's a length k substring, same thing. Um, and you know, in the paper, they looked at these use cases of clustering the genome database, searching genomes, um, and computing distance between metagenomic samples. And I know none of what that means. But I'm very excited that these ideas were used in, in computational biology. Uh, this is just like I was looking for other examples, uh, another paper, you know, from a couple years ago. There's a bunch, you know, the, of places where this seems to be popping up in various ways in computational biology. And so now I think I am finishing more or less approximately on schedule. Um, so Locality sensitive hashing is, is an awesome tool. Um, uh, I've, you know, you get to next hear Hayden talk about real stuff after this uh, preliminary stuff that, that's uh, really fantastic using, like this is just one of the, the like half a dozen techniques Hayden uses to put together this amazing um, um, diagnostic system that he'll be talking about. Um, but I just, you know, for those of you who are here, uh, like I said, I, I'm always excited to work with road people on, on anything algorithmic. That sort of, it, it's nice for me to feel like I'm having an impact on like actual real things. And, uh, and I, I appreciate and I'm amazed by all the stuff all, all of you do. Um, you can find more about me on my webpage or more about some of the things that I find interesting by, by looking at my, my textbook on, on randomized algorithms and probabilistic analysis. And uh, whew, I'm done. Um, sorry, it took longer than I thought, but I, I'm still on time and maybe even have time for a question or two. Perfectly on time. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll lead off with a question, actually. Uh, the thesaurus problem. Mm -hmm. uh, are there ways to deal with that? Like, we deal with that in biology as well. There can be certain sequences that sort of have similar meaning with biologically, but different you know, instantiations within the sequence. Yeah, so, so I think that's hard. And I think actually Hayden had to, had to deal with a, a, an actual issue like this, uh, you know, GU, uh, GU RNA pairing or something that, that he'll talk about. Um, and, you know, you, you could imagine just saying it's like, well, okay, um, what I'll do is I'll canonicalize each word by like, you know, if these things match in the thesaurus, I'll give it some same label, right? And like that could work, but the problem is it introduces the chance for more spurious matches, right? And again, I think Hayden, Hayden can talk about it and correct me afterwards, but I think Hayden faced this very problem of these like, well, if I say these two things are the same, right? Then I get spurious matches, too many spurious matches. So I have to do something clever more clever than just saying like, well, I'm just going to treat all these words that are the same in the thesaurus as the same. Um, because if you do that, you'd end up getting too many matches in this situation. Um, that's something you could do for English words. It's harder. You, know, they, you may have to find something else more complicated to do if that leads to overmatching. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful uh, primer. Um, so I will mention uh, locality sensitive hatching. Um, I think there are two places in particular where there's a really nice application of it in this work, um, and I'll call it out there. 
Uh, so if you take yourself back a little over a year ago, you might remember there is this feeling of how little we know about this new virus with headlines like these. Um, and as soon as it hit here in the US, most of that early confusion and chaos almost immediately focused on diagnostics. Um, you know, it, it was widely reported that the United States was doing a poor job testing last spring, um, really a first stemming from a technical issue uh, in the US CDC's assay. Um, and of course, there are regulatory, logistical, um, and, and leadership issues that made matters worse as well. But there's nothing at all new about that. Um, so I made a slide for, for Zika virus years ago with the same pair of news stories. Um, so Zika in, in 2015 and 2016 was a little known virus. Um, and the big focus, um, again, uh, was really on diagnostic complications, uh, as you can see um, in the headline on the right. So, so Zika especially was a critical failure in surveillance uh, and testing. So here uh, on this plot, the distribution show an estimate of the date when Zika entered four different regions in the Americas, um, which were computed from genomic data. And the dots to the right of each distribution are the date that the virus uh, was first confirmed in each place. Um, so the dots fall considerably to the right of each distribution, which means that Zika was circulating uh, undetected in each of these regions for, for many months. The, the main region for that lag is probably just that labs weren't testing for Zika. People knew about it. Um, by these dates, Zika was, was actually already confirmed in Brazil, um, but there were still obstacles to diagnostic testing. Um, there was also just lots of concern about false negatives, uh, even with PCR testing, which we often think of as like the gold standard for sensitivity. Uh, that's because of these impossibly low viral loads that you see with Zika uh, in a short window when someone might have detectable virus. Um, so from a technical standpoint, testing for Zika is actually uh, quite complicated. Um, and all that uncertainty and, and confusion really didn't help uh, um, the situation. So, so these are clearly very practical challenges that we face uh, in getting diagnostics uh, up and running for a new virus. Um, but there are also difficulties for existing viruses. So flu is a great example. Um, here are eight widely used commercial PCR assays for flu. Uh, these are all FDA approved or the European equivalent, um, which means it went through this, this rigorous process. Um, and the numbers in the table are sensitivities across a large cohort of samples. Um, so, so evolution introduces mutations between the genome and the primer probe designs. Um, and it kind of becomes a game of chance where, where some tests are fine uh, and others suffer. Um, so many of these tests have rather low sensitivity because they're not doing well in detecting some common flu strains, especially H3N2 strains. Um, and these flu tests actually generally target a conserved non-structural gene. Um, if we wanted to say subtype what flu you have, you know, is it like H1 or H3 or H5? Um, the problem becomes even harder because then we have to target much less conserved genes. And there are just lots of other examples um, in many other viruses of, of similar challenges like these. Um, for, you know, for COVID, we all hear about variants uh, in the news now, and, and particularly as it relates to vaccines, um, but there ought to be similar vigilance about diagnostics. So here's a plot uh, showing mutations that passed a 1% frequency along the genome during each month of 2020. Um, any of these can degrade you know, some diagnostic design. There are like many, many preprints um, about how one of these polymorphisms impacts some particular qPCR assay. Um, it feels like you know, every day there's a new one on, on MedArchive or BarArchive. Um, my, my favorite example, uh, which I reference here, was about a SNP um, that was estimated at about 30% frequency in this one county in California, um, but low frequency globally. And, and this county was using some particular widely used tests uh, and the SNP significantly lowered sensitivity of that test um, in that county. Um, these failures tend to be discovered serendipitously. Um, and, and my guess is that it's a more widespread problem than some limited studies indicate. So that there's certainly room for improved design approaches to help address these types of problems. 
Um, we, we have lots of viral genomes now across thousands of viruses, and we've gotten quite good at generating that genomic data. Um, but there's a lot to do in how we apply that data. So we wanted to use that genomic data in combination with uh, algorithms and models to design diagnostics at scale. Um, and so what I'll build up to today is a system that lets us rapidly design diagnostic assays for new viruses, and that can create designs at scale for uh, thousands of viruses that are broadly effective across genomic variation. And we can imagine you know, taking these and invalidating some of them experimentally across many strains. So they're kind of you know, on the shelf and, and ready to go when needed. Um, one, one point I do wanna emphasize is that to do this work, we should have objectives for what we want in a diagnostic. Um, pr principled objectives are, are surprisingly lacking when it comes to their design, um, and it, which is largely based on heuristics and, and trial and error. Um, so I'm gonna define and refer repeatedly to ob objective functions. Um, and I, I think that this is just really uh, important to be able to say that we want to have a diagnostic that is optimal with respect to some well-defined objective. So here we're going to concentrate uh, as an application on CRISPR-based diagnostics for viruses. Um, and in this system, we have a CRISPR enzyme, specifically Cas13. Um, it was actually discovered here uh, at the Broad. Um, and, and it attaches to a guide that binds to a viral target that we want to detect. Um, so very briefly, how this actually works in practice is that we first amplify a region of the genome with primers. Um, and then when that guide and its Cas13 enzyme binds to a target that we want to detect, the enzyme changes its state uh, to an activated one and starts collaterally cutting all RNA. Um, so in this sense, it's a little bit different than, than Cas9, which you may have heard of. Um, and, and once it's activated, uh, it then cuts a fluorescent reporter that's also in the sample. And so when that fluorescent reporter becomes uh, cut, we can detect the fluorescence from that reporter. Um, and I'm gonna refer to this idea of a guide target pair a lot. Um, and we'll use a symbol right here just, just to refer to that. Some guides are going to work better than others because of their sequence composition, because of um, you know, where exactly they're targeting and their similarity to the target and other factors. Um, and also just most of these design ideas that I'll tell you about uh, apply to other diagnostic technologies as well, including um, amplification-based ones like qPCR um, and also just to, to non-viral targets too. Um, so I, I'm gonna frame our work in terms of three key challenges with designing diagnostics in a way that builds up um, kind of from the bottom up to a design system. Um, the first challenge on the modeling side is about predicting how well a perspective design will work. Uh, the second, more algorithmic, um, is about how we use that model and ultimately account for vast genomic variation. Um, I include as part of that, you know, sensitivity or, or comprehensiveness across lineages. And we'll also discuss their um, just specificity and primers. Um, and, and last, more on the system side, is about how we can do the design efficiently when the number of viral genomes is growing exponentially. Um, in particular, designing efficiently across thousands of viruses while supporting the need to periodically redesign assays. Um, in, in my opinion, uh, most of the interesting like, algorithmic novelty of the work is in the second and third parts. So I'm gonna focus um, on those, but, but all of these pieces are really important for what we're trying to do. Um, so, so the first challenge has to do with predicting how well a design will work and detecting a target. And that matters a lot, again, because some will be better than others. The standard approach is really uh, to treat the question in kind of a binary way. Um, a design detects a target or it does not. Uh, that may use thermodynamic criteria, often uses some basic heuristics for what works or doesn't. Um, you know, for example, like are there more than two mismatches you know, between a guide and a target? Um, the approach that we took here in contrast looks at this more quantitatively, uh, using a model to predict the enzymatic activity of a design and detecting a target. Um, and that uh, corresponds to how sensitive that design is. To actually do this, we designed 20,000 guide target pairs, um, and we designed their sequence in a way that is um, representative of what you'd see in viral genomes. Um, and because we care about viruses, we really emphasize mismatches between the guides and the targets so we can learn how well the design would work against variation. 
and we used um, this highly or this new highly multiplex technology, Carmen, uh, to measure the fluorescence over time uh, for each pair, effectively the, the diagnostic readout. Um, and Nick, who I, I point out here, uh, did this great work showing from, from forest order kinetics uh, that the fluorescence over time has this relationship. Um, it's proportional to, neg to the negative of an exponential decay and that exponential decay term models how much of the fluorescent reporters left in the reaction, you know, not yet cut by Cas13. Um, so the amount of reporter goes down over time and the fluorescence goes up. I mean, I say proportional because there, there's also a multiplicative term reflecting um, the, the saturation and another term for, for the background signal. Um, but the variable K here represents the rate at which the fluorescent reporter is cut. And it, we can show it depends on two terms. Um, so one is the efficiency of the guide target complex in, in cleaving the reporter. Uh, the other is the concentration of that guide target complex. What we really care about here uh, for a diagnostic um, is modeling that first piece, the, the catalytic e efficiency. Uh, and so we're gonna, what we uh, did is hold the second factor constant um, when generating our data set. Um, and, and so using all of our fluorescence measurements over time, we fit a curve with this form for each guide target pair. And then we estimate that value K. Um, and what I'll refer to as activity is actually the log transform of K. Um, I, I do want to point out that we didn't just, you know, want this data set. Um, we really needed it. Um, so as far as I know, there's really nothing on this kind of scale um, in terms of a data set measuring the performance for, for viral diagnostics. So there are some guide target pairs that show no reporter activation um, and therefore no uh, detectable signal, um, at least over the time span that, that we were taking measurements, which is about two hours. Um, and that's expected, for example, there may be no RNA binding at all. Um, and we reason that there may be separate processes governing whether a guide target pair is active compared to its, its level of activity if it is active. Uh, so we chose to model the activity with a two-step hurdle model, which includes a classifier and a separate regression model. Um, for the classifier, we tested a number of models that could be well-suited um, and, and that have been used in the past for related work. What I'm showing here is the area under the ROC curve for these models evaluated using a, a nested cross-validation. Um, so the error bars are across uh, five outer folds. Uh, and we also tried different types of inputs, um, which are in the different colors, including handcrafted features um, and just features that would help a linear model to learn about where there are mismatches. Um, so a, a, a component outperforms the other models here, um, and it also does so when we look at precision recall. Um, the schematic on the right shows the input to that model, which is just a one-hot encoded nucleotide sequence where both the um, the guide and target are aligned with each other. Uh, and we did the same thing um, with the regression, which I'm not showing here, uh, on the active guide target pairs and, and see the same result. Um, so the the CNN is mostly vanilla. Um, one interesting thing though, um, that we found is that having locally connected layers uh, improves performance. Um, so this type of layer is where there are separate filters uh, with unshared weights for different regions of sequence. Uh, we still have the more typical convolutional layer with shared weights before. Um, so what may, what may be happening here um, is that the convolutional layers can learn, for example, patterns of mismatches between the guide and the target. And then the locally connected layer helps to learn um, some strong spatial dependencies in this data, um, which we would expect to see. For example, the existence of a, a, a you know, highly mismatch sensitive region in a particular location of the guide target cas complex. Um, so, so here's an ROC curve in, in the black line for the classifier on held out data. Um, and just to give some like very rough intuition as to whether this is helpful, I think it helps to benchmark against um, like a canonical rule-based heuristic that's often used. Uh, so what the dots show are our sensitivity and false positive rate. If we decide a guide to be active uh, based on whether it has the correct PFS or predispositor flanking site, which is like CAS13's version of a PAM um, and the number of mismatches. Uh, whether that number of mismatches is within some threshold um, 
which varies between the different colors. So at equivalent sensitivity, we, we do see a lower false positive rate. Um, and so and for a regression on the active guide drug appears uh, here, true activities on the horizontal axis um, and vertically we broke out predictions by the, the predictions quartile. Um, so, so basically our predictions can do a good job at separating out good and bad guides. Um, so what the models provide us, um, which is a little bit more, are, are basically a function to calculate an activity between a guide and a target sequence. Um, so here I'm representing it by that, that function A. Um, but we can also use multiple guides. Uh, we can imagine using them in parallel reactions and then basing our detection on the best one. Basically, you know, we can try each of these guides and if any of them works, we say that our target is there. Uh, so to model that, we take the max, um, which then will give us a function telling us how well a guide set works in detecting a target. Um, and so this function is going to be useful um, for all the work that I'm about to tell you about. Um, and also everything that I'm, I'll tell you about from here on is really model agnostic. Um, it can work in any black box predictive model, even one that's non-differentiable, um, whether it's for CAS13 or, or some other uh, detection technology, it doesn't really matter. Um, but just you know, to focus on some application, what we chose here was CAS13. Uh, so that was all about you know, how can we predict how well you know, detection will work. Um, the second major challenge, um, a bit more on the algorithmic side, is that viruses vary. Um, and we want to be able to handle that variation. Uh, so as, as I mentioned at the start, there are tests with um, high false negative rates because of variation in viral genomes. I, I often struggle to convey um, like just how much variation there can be among viral genomes. I think visually might be the best way. Uh, so here's a piece of an alignment of Lassa virus, which is an endemic in parts of West Africa, and the polymorphisms are, are colored. Um, if anything, this is actually from a more conserved segment of the genome. Um, so you can just see, you know, lots of variants. Um, and if you can, if you pick two genomes randomly and compare them, about one in four positions would be different. Um, same thing for a totally different virus. Uh, this is enterovirus B, uh, which is a widely circulating respiratory virus. Um, I, I picked this region of the genome arbitrarily. There's nothing especially diverse about it. Uh, these two examples are definitely on the high side as far as variation within a species goes, but they're not exceptional. Um, so I could give many other examples like this. Honestly, the most common approach that I see uh, handling this variation is just ignoring it altogether. Um, there are some design approaches that consider it by looking for conserved genome regions and then designing an assay to match a single sequence you know, in that conserved uh, region. Um, but this still really treats variation in, in, in a marginal way, um, and these do have downsides. So what we wanted to do, uh, which is in contrast to prior approaches, is to directly integrate that variation into an objective function. Um, and so what we will end up doing is to maximize our detection and expectation over the known variation. Um, so to start out, let's imagine um, just considering one region of the genome, which is let's say like a few hundred nucleotides long. Um, and we have all the known genomes that are aligned um, in that region. So what we'll first do is find representative cameras across that genomic variation. Um, for CAS13, there are 28 MERS. Um, this is actually an example where um, we use locality sensitive hashing. I think it's actually a, not a very interesting example. So I, I'm going to kind of gloss over it and we'll come back to locality sensitive hashing um, in a bit more detail and in two other cases where I think they're a bit more interesting. Um, but using our predictive model, uh, we can calculate pairwise activities between each candidate guide and each of those genomes. Um, and what this gives us is a ground set uh, of candidate guides, uh, where each guide in that ground set you know, has an associated activities across all of our known genome variation. Um, and then what our objective is going to be is to find the guides from that ground set that have the maximal activity and expectation across all of that genomic variation. Um, so he here's a function A of G that gives that expected activity. Um, if we just maximize this function alone, based on how we define activity, we use 
uh, all of the kites. Um, and that has downsides. Uh, so it would mean more reactions, which requires more time and more cost. Um, so what will maximize in particular has constraints on the number of guides or, or the cardinality of G. Uh, so there's a soft constraint, which is weighted by this variable lambda or parameter lambda. Um, and we usually set that soft constraint to one, um, just to penalize anything that has more than one guide. Um, hey, and as a hard, uh, yeah. Uh, just a quick question about experimental procedures. Can you pool guides and how does the, like if you pool a weak and a strong guide or well, a, an effective guide, is it dominated by one or the other? Yeah, um, so you, you definitely can. Um, I don't think we have a good understanding about pulling it. Um, what can end up happening is that basically the, the, the CRISPR enzyme you know, takes up and attaches to certain guides. And so if you put multiple guides in the reaction, that may not be uniform. And so you may have some guides that are you know, being basically used more. You could also have some unintended consequences or like one weekly binds and that blocks one that might be better performing. Um, there's probably a different way you'd want to frame our objective function if you were pulling them. Um, what we do is actually just, just use them in parallel reactions um, with, with this multiplex system. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so that's, our, that's our soft constraint that we set. Um, and we also have a hard constraint um, on the number of guides, which we usually set to something um, like around five. Uh, and we can prove that this objective function is submodular. Uh, that basically means um, that as we add uh, more and more guides, um, we'll see diminishing returns and how good the design will be. I think there was actually an MIA talk like two years ago or two and a half years on uh, some modular optimization. Um, and I think that this result, you know, of seeing diminishing returns, uh, it makes intuitive sense. Um, it's also great because there's a lot of work on, on maximizing submodular functions with a uh, cardinality constraint. Um, our function is also non-negative as long as we impose a constraint on what guides are allowed in the guide set, um, which I wrote with that constraint here. The constraint works out to be quite reasonable um, in practice. Um, so that's also good. Um, and the function, I should note, is, is non -mono it's not monotone, um, only because of that, that soft constraint here. So at some point, the objective value will start coming down as we add more and more guides. Um, luckily, there is this very elegant algorithm for maximizing a non-negative, non-monotone submodular function, um, and it gives us a constant factor approximation. So that's what we use. Um, and the solution is within a factor of 1 over E of the optimal. I should note, um, a, a simple greedy algorithm, uh, which is more simple than this, uh, actually works well in practice for the problem. And I think we could use it. Um, it just doesn't have those provable guarantees here because it requires the function to be monotone. Um, and so we solve this optimization problem and then return those guides. Um, and, and it works well. Um, so we can take a look in silico across Lassa virus uh, to see how many genomes we might detect. Lassa is one of those uh, example alignments that I showed you before. Um, so the approach that I just described uh, is in purple if we only allow one guide um, in green and yellow for, for two or three guides. Um, is baselines in, in beige colors are the consensus or the most common uh, 28 mer that you would see in a, in a sliding window across the genome. So actually here, I'm, I'm using like a very simplified activity function just to make things easier to interpret. Um, it's just a binary one where the expected activity ends up being the same as the fraction of detected sequences. Normally though, it, it would be um, quantitative. Uh, and so this optimization approach detects more sequences throughout the genome, even with just a single guide. Um, and having more options throughout the genome matters. Um, and it matters in particular because there are two more constraints that I haven't yet talked about that end up being very important and limit where we might be able to target. Um, so one of those additional constraints is specificity. Um, so, so some Viruses are closely related to one another, as you know, you know, and we want a positive for one and a negative, you know, for all the others. Um, in other words, you know, our assay to be specific. Um, the way that we approach this here is just to query those guides um, that are in the ground set against some database uh, and ignore them if they're close enough to some sequence in another virus. So we effectively, we're imposing a, another uh, hard constraint on our problem. Um, and th there are some particular challenges here. 
So the first uh, is that we want to tolerate multiple mismatches over a short query length when doing these lookups. Um, yeah, most sequence lookup algorithms like BLAST or, or like short read aligners require some seed uh, to have an exact match to a hit, basically to, to seed the lookup. Um, but we may not have a seed. Um, and either, even if our guides do have a seed region where we can use that exact match, which is the case in CAS 13, um, it, it may be extremely short and tolerant of like one or two mismatches. So these usual seed-based lookup techniques are not really um, that helpful. Uh, this challenge alone is actually, it's not so bad. Um, so we implemented and tested uh, this probabilistic uh, space seed approach. Um, actually very, very closely related to even using locality sensitive hashing. Um, and it works pretty well, like for this challenge alone. Um, it's really the second challenge here that ends up being uh, very tricky. Um, so in some applications, uh, which includes the one that we're concentrating on here, RNA binds to RNA. Um, so we're using a CRISPR RNA to detect an RNA target. And that permits uh, GU wobble base pairs in addition to the usual Watson Crick base pairs um, that expand the potential for non-specificity. Uh, and empirically, this really is um, a potential problem. Uh, so we can take the 570 viruses that are known to infect humans um, and for each of them, make a bunch of queries against the other 569 for potential non-specificity. And then count, you know, how often do we find non-specific hits? So these distributions show that across the 570 um, viruses. And we can do that ignoring GU pairing in green, and then also counting GU pairs as true matches here in purple during these lookups, um, and allowing for different numbers and mismatches that we would count, you know, as being a non-specific hit. Um, the takeaway here. Um, it was really just that if we ignore the problem, as in green, we'll, we'll rarely find non-specific hits. Um, but if we do account for it, as we should, um, in purple, it can be rather common to find these off-target hits between viral species, um, and, and it makes a big difference. Um, so this actually gets to the question that Ray uh, had asked Mike at the end of um, the primer, which is about like, you know, how do we tolerate lookups where our cameras may not be you know, exactly the same, but we want to think about them as the same way. Um, and, and so one you know, trick to, to handle that challenge uh, is just to collapse our sequences to a two-letter alphabet um, that's just Gs and Us. Uh, so here, any two strings that are identical opt to GU pairing um, will end up being the same in this reduced alphabet. Um, it actually ends up being overkill for our particular problem, but it does help um, quite a bit. I mean, so from that reduced alphabet, we developed this bespoke data structure that basically shards the cameras across viruses into many small tries, um, and also an associated query algorithm that can efficiently look up guides in this data structure. Um, and that is exact for any number of mismatches and for GU pairs. Um, it, it works pretty well for our application, uh, though it is still the bottleneck in our whole system. And, and there's room for improvement or even just for a more clever solution. Um, for the sake of time, I, I won't go into detail about this. It would be like a, a five minute detour into a bespoke data structure. Um, but I only bring this up, you know, really to stress that it is a real challenge. Um, it's probably the biggest, you know, again, computational challenge in the whole process. And so if you are interested in data structures and, and string matching, I think this is an exciting problem um, with the potential to make a, a real improvement in multiple areas. All right, um, so everything that we've talked about so far is just in one region of a genome. Um, the one thing left is to explore across the genome um, to find where it is that we actually want to target. Um, and to do this, we use a search that follows the branch and bound paradigm. So we start with a heap of size N, uh, which will store the best N designs. And this lets us return multiple different assay designs. For example, if you want to target multiple regions of a genome or have you know, multiple options to test. Um, and then we design potential primer sequences throughout the genome. Uh, so finding these primer sequences follows a, a similar uh, combinatorial optimization approach to what I described for guides, um, except sadly for there, we, we don't have a predictive model. Um, and so for now, we're relying on, on heuristics for the primers, um, though I, I think that could change. Um, in the future. Uh, and then we'll consider some uh, amplicon in the genome 
that is bound uh, by these primers. And then from that amplicon, we can compute an opera bound uh, how good a design will be in this region. Basically, if we could use you know, a, a single guide with maximal activity, that would help us compute an opera bound. Um, we can compare that then to the worst design in the heap. And if the amplicon can never make it into the heap, we go back um, and just, just try another. So that's like the bound piece of branch and bound. Um, and if the amplicon could be a good option, we'll use everything that we talked about so far to design a guide set in it. Um, remember that this part is expensive, so we want to avoid it um, if possible. And now we have a potential design. We add it into our heap if it outperforms the current worst. Um, and then if there are more amplicons left, we'll just iteratively you know, try, try them um, over and over. Um, and we're done one, once the heap, uh, or when we're done, the heap has our final list of, of assay designs. And by the way, there are a number of tricks um, with some more detail in the paper um, that help to speed this process up um, and, and just make it practical. Um, so still being on the topic of variation, I do just want to tell you about a tidbit that, that's in the early stages, but I, that I think is interesting. Um, you know, so it may be very early in an outbreak and we don't have a sense of a virus's variation. Um, and we want to be proactive against possible changes in that genome. Um, or even, even if we do have a good understanding about how a virus varies, we may still want to be proactive. So what we do here is to use a, a nucleotide substitution model to provide a, a distribution of relatively likely substitutions in the genome. Um, and we learn the parameters of the substitution model from our genomic data. Um, and if we don't have, or we don't know enough about the genomic variation of a virus to do that, what's nice about this approach is that we can learn the parameters from a closely related virus for which we do have more data and the model should transfer over well. Um, so with this model, we can then simulate sequences some number of years out, say like five years out. And it just provides like a very wide distribution of potential target sequences that we may encounter. Um, but we can compare our guide against this, this wide distribution. So for example, there may be some relatively likely change in the genome that would harm a particular guide's performance based on how that guide is positioned. You know, so this would, would help us to avoid that, that kind of case. Um, most of the time, unsurprisingly, we don't see much uh, change. Um, so on a tested design for SARS-CoV-2, we only see a drop in performance um, with about a 20% likelihood after five years. Um, so it is kind of rare, you know, according to this model, but, but still helpful to know in like a risk averse type of situation. Um, we are the first that I know of to do something like this. Uh, and I think the method has like quite broad applicability. Um, and there are just a lot of places to expand on it and, and to make it better. Um, so I am excited by this type of approach. All right, so that, that was everything about variation. Uh, the last big challenge that I want to talk about um, is really scalability. Um, so the, the number of viral genomes in databases has long been growing exponentially. Uh, here's a number of, of viral genomes on this plot um, that you know, are, are from viruses known to infect humans over time. I mean, that's before COVID. So I, I made this plot in 2019. Um, if I add in the year 2020, it would look something like this because there are like, I don't know, like 700,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes now. Um, it would go you know, way above the screen. Um, and on top of that, we, we sometimes need to periodically redesign diagnostics because of new variation that emerges. The usual approach, um, just, just from a very practical point of view, you know, it has a lot of manual time um, in preparing data. And so it's not all that like scalable or, or sustainable. Um, and what we really wanted to do here is to fully automatically design up-to-date diagnostics um, without needing any human input. So we created ADAPT for that goal. Uh, and ADAPT's input can be as simple as just a viral species or some other taxonomy. And it connects to public databases to download and, and curate that data. Um, so it runs end to end in making um, designs. So ADAPT implements you know, all of the methods that I told you about here to design diagnostics focused on, on CRISPR-based diagnostics. That's everything on the right here. Um, but to actually get to that uh, and to make ADAPT end to end, we need to focus on the left. Like how do we get this data in a format that's ready to be processed. Um, and then so we use APIs from NCBI to download genomes for our input virus and also, um, also all of its related viruses because we care about specificity, as I mentioned. 
Um, but, but public databases are messy. Uh, genomes can be misclassified. You know, they can be entered in some unusual orientation, sometimes, you know, filled with sequencing artifacts and so on. Um, so it really does help to curate that data. Um, and locality sensitive hashing, which Mike uh, talked about, is really helpful uh, because we can do this in an alignment free way um, quickly. So in particular, we'll use the, the min hash scheme that, that Mike talked about. Um, and we can take a, a genome, just to again, summarize this, um, we can take a genome, you know, treat it as a bag of k-mers, um, and then from those k-mers, compute a sketch. And once we have those sketches, um, it's fast to compare two genomes, considerably faster than it would be uh, to like compare the whole genomes. Um, and here an approximation or an estimate it is good enough for our use case. Uh, so in particular, comparing the sketches provides um, an estimate on the Jacquard similarity between those camera sets for a pair of genomes. Uh, and there's this nice paper that, that Mike had mentioned um, lays out something called the MASH distance. Um, and really what it's doing is providing a relationship between Jacquard similarity from KMERS and average nucleotide identity. Um, and being able to compare genomes in this way and to quickly get an average nucleotide identity makes it faster than it would otherwise be to remove clear outliers um, and to cluster genomes. So having clusters um, and basically producing designs separately on clusters uh, you know, can be helpful for the like exceptionally diverse viruses where it may be hard to, to think about them as a single taxon. Um, so using all of this, we designed diagnostic assays fully automatically for all uh, 1,900 viruses that are known to infect vertebrates. Um, I do just want to mention actually clustering curation is, is helpful to cover all, all the cases, um, but it's not required for like a typical species. Starting out, I think I had thought that clustering genomes and designing separately on these clusters um, would be needed more widely. It turns out we can actually do a good job um, though with just one cluster for all but four species. Um, though we do still need, you know, some amount of curation. Um, the designs end up being practical. Uh, so here, every dot is a species showing how many uh, genomes there are for that species on the horizontal axis. And then the plot shows um, vertically just how many guides we need for uh, the design. So in all cases, we, we you know, end up using few guides and short apple cons. It's also fast. Um, so it, it's under 38 hours uh, for all of these species, and most of them, you know, are a lot faster. Um, and again, this is without any human input. Um, so I, I think this is exciting because it means that we're, you know, basically at the point of being able to have a resource of diagnostics that are broadly effective and always up to date uh, for the latest known viruses um, and their variation. Um, so, so all of like the focus of MIA is on methods. I just want to take a couple of minutes to show some experimental results um, using uh, ADAPT's designs, um, just to show that like not only can ADAPT make designs at scale, but that they are actually useful. Um, so we tested and benchmarked ADAPT designs here, really focused on the guides um, at, at a really massive scale as far as diagnostics go. Um, so for our first simple example, we started with a single known target, uh, the US CDC's N1 target, which is common for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Um, and we used just a, a standard rule-based approach. We designed uh, 10 CAS13 guides in this region, um, which are the ones in gray. And the plot shows fluorescence at different viral loads um, from high to low. Uh, so ADAPT's design in green has a higher fluorescence than all 10 baselines. Um, it also grows at a faster rate. Um, and we saw the same result in another common target for SARS-CoV-2. So it works well in this easy case you know, just detecting one known target. And that was really encouraging. Um, so we really wanted to test like the comprehensiveness and specificity from ADAPT's designs. Uh, so for that, we looked at several viruses that make up the species um, SARS-related coronavirus. Um, here's just a kind of toy tree showing some key groupings in that species. Uh, purple or, or lineage J is the virus that we're all familiar with, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so we first tested SARS-CoV-2, the different rows represent different viral loads uh, in this plot. And we saw exquisite specificity for SARS-CoV-2. We also avoid detecting lineage B, which is a bat virus that has 96% uh, identity to SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's the same thing for SARS-CoV-2 related, uh, which encompasses some of these bat and pangolin viruses that are like SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this example is actually particularly challenging because we face this like balance between comprehensiveness and specificity. 
Um, and again, the same for the full SARS related species. Um, again, like full comprehensiveness and, and specificity against the other coronaviruses. Uh, the experiment that we were actually most excited about is how well can we do at designing a species specific assay to detect uh, enterovirus B. Um, so enterovirus B is again, the, the other example that I show you is an exceptionally diverse virus um, with 63 uh, known types. So there are actually you know, other enteroviruses as well that are you know, as diverse. Um, and so what this is showing um, for ADAPT is how well we detect 11 targets going from left to right that represent most uh, of the virus's variation. I um, mean, again, vertically, this is at different viral loads that we were testing against in what we were detecting. Home copies per microliter. Um, and so to benchmark, we made a guide by what's like probably a state-of-the-art strategy that we could you know, rigorously define, um, which is identifying the sites that have the minimal variation according to Shannon entropy. Um, and that might still allow specificity and using a rule-based criteria at those sites. I um, mean, you can see just from here that, that adapts are showing higher fluorescence. Um, we can also look at how fluorescence changes over time at that lowest viral loads. So here, just for the, the four biggest targets. Um, and adapts provide detection against variants, which our baseline does not. Um, so these results are uh, definitely encouraging. Um, so not only can we produce highly effective designs in this fully automated way, um, but in challenging cases like this one, they even outperform you know, existing uh, techniques. Um, so all of this is on BioArchive as a preprint. Um, there are also more aspects, and of course, just a lot more detail that I didn't have a chance to go into today. Um, here's a DOI in case you want to you know, write it down or, or screenshot to find the paper. Um, and all of our code uh, for ADAPT um, and our modeling and our analysis is on GitHub. <laughs> um, so shifting gears, I just want to spend like five or 10 minutes uh, discussing a, a very different problem in viral genomics but where similar ideas can be helpful. Um, so stepping back, the, the way that I look at biotechnologies um, that interrogate viruses is just very, you know, very roughly is to divide them along two dimensions. Uh, so here in the vertical red dimension, we see you know, how much information are we getting? Are we just identifying if something is in a sample or not, or are we getting you know, on the top deep, deep genomic data? On the other dimension, the blue horizontal one, uh, we see how many things can we recognize. You know, are we just going to recognize one species, sometimes even only one strain, um, or are we able to look at many species at a time? Um, so what I talked about today with ADAPT is really focused on the bottom half of this graph, um, just identifying whether a pathogen is in a sample or not. Um, so what I'll do now is um, just again briefly talk about the, the top half of the graph, um, which has to do with sequencing viruses. And so what our goal is here uh, is to take an approach, um, a technology called capture enrichment, uh, which is this sensitive technique for sequencing that has traditionally targeted one species at a time and move, basically move it over to the right um, to sensitively target many viruses at a time. And the way that this approach works is that we start with a standard short read sequencing library. Um, and uh, you know, often uh, when a virus you know, is in that sample, it's just a tiny fraction um, of the library. Uh, so for many viruses, only about like one in a hundred thousand reads you know, might actually be from that virus. So it's just terribly inefficient to sequence the whole library. Um, and depending on our sequencing depth, it just lacks sensitivity and, and doesn't provide enough data to assemble a genome. So we do here introduce probes that bind to fragments in that library. Um, and the probes have magnetic beads. Uh, so we use a magnet to pull them out and amplify what they hybridize to, and then sequence just those fragments. Um, so, so what we do here is, is focus on the design of those probes. And we want our, our probes that can capture many species at a time, including all of the known variation for all of them, um, and, and in particular, all the whole genome variation, because again, we're interested in, in whole genome sequencing. Um, so catch is a method to do this. Uh, and what we start out with in catch are, are unaligned genomes for each species, representing all of their known variation, um, and also some number n of the total number of probes that we want, which is usually dictated by how much we're willing to spend. Um, and our objective here is to find 
the best end probes that fully enrich all of the whole genomes spanning all the known variation for each species. Um, I, I do just want to note that there, there are definitely different ways that you could formalize this objective. Uh, for example, you could maximize a set function over the whole probe set, uh, subject to lots of constraints to make sure that we capture variation. What I'll show you is just the you know, one way that I chose, which is tractable and leads to intuitive outputs. Um, so let's start by considering you know, one species S that we're designing for. Um, we need a hybridization model that decides whether some probe enriches some region of a genome. Um, and that model here has these parameters given by theta sub s. Uh, so for example, theta sub s may encompass like the divergence between a probe and a genome. Um, some choices of theta sub s are, are less stringent than others, and that will affect how much enrichment we see, uh, or if we see any enrichment at all. Um, so first we generate candidate probes by tiling along all the genomes. Uh, and then we actually use locality sensitive hashing to rapidly collapse them down. So in particular, we do this using like a near neighbor um, lookup based on locality sensitive hashing. Um, you know, basically we, we construct a bunch of hash tables. Again, it can be under a min hash scheme. Um, it could also be under like a Hamming distance scheme that like I mentioned um, and find probes that hash to the same bucket. Um, and so we can, uh, then once we have this like reduced set of candidate probes, um, we can find the minimal collection that fully covers all of our variation according to theta sub s. Uh, so you may recognize this as like an instance of the well-studied set cover problem in computer science, um, where here a set represents a probe and includes all the variation that it's going to capture. Um, and we use the greedy algorithm for, for this, which gives essentially the best polynomial time approximation. And so our, our final probe set is the union across each of the individual species where each one has some theta sub s chosen for it. And so to decide this theta sub s, we define a loss function um, over the choice of, of theta sub s for each species because some choices are, are better than other choices. Um, and if we want, we can also weigh species differently. For example, we think that we're you know, more likely to encounter certain ones. Um, and what I kind of think of this loss function as doing um, is basically achieving a balancing act between doing well across all the species and accommodating those extremely diverse ones um, that will require a lot of probes. Um, so then we solve for the best choice of theta sub s across all the species, subject to our constraint on the total number of probes um, and also on reasonable choices of theta sub s. Uh, you know, there are many ways to solve a constrained convex minimization problem like this one. Uh, in catch, um, we use a log barrier method to enforce that constraint on n and then a truncate into an algorithm to solve it. Uh, so what we get out are probes uh, that have guarantees on whole genome capture under this hybridization model using the most stringent criteria that we can find. Um, I also, just very importantly, um, find that the outputs are intuitive on a per species level and that, you know, I think it's easy for a lot of users to look at the values and have a sense for how good or how bad the probe set will be for a species as long as they understand the theta of best choices. Um, and so we use catch design approach set against all 356 viruses uh, that were known to infect humans um, and set the limit at 350,000 probes based on cost considerations. Um, this is actually the first version, one that we thoroughly tested um, and that we designed almost five years ago. Uh, there are, I hesitated in saying 356 viruses because there, there are more recent versions now that have you know, over 600 uh, species. Um, we also designed a number of other like more focused probe sets. I um, mean, we, we did a lot of thorough validation of it, you know, how well it improves detection, how accurate it is, and applied it to real samples uh, from several outbreaks. Um, I, I just wanted to mention Catch because it shows how we can use some similar ideas in ADAPT um, to enhance a very different kind of application here, whole genome sequencing. Um, but I wanted to keep the focus on methods. So for more detail about the method, um, and all of our results, you can see um, our paper that I cited here. Uh, and yeah, so I, I, I've been um, fortunate to work with just an incredibly generous um, and inspiring group of people throughout both of these projects. I did all this work in the Civetti lab. Here's one of our lab's um, recent holiday cards. Um, and so here are just a few of the amazing people um, in particular who I worked closely with uh, on these projects. And yeah, thanks for the chance again to to talk here.